All right, well, my clock reads 1.30, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, like I stated a few minutes ago, everybody is on mute and your video is turned off. Uh, there is question and answer, a checkbox. Um, I believe you can raise your hand if you have a question. I might not see it right away, but um, we'll definitely do question and A at the end. I wanna thank you all for um, participating in our virtual junior conservation camp. This is new for all of us, so it's definitely um, been a learning experience, but we hope that you're getting as much out of it as we are. So my webinar today is called Amazing Owls, and I have to tell you right up front that I am not a bird expert, I'm not an owl expert, I just really love nature. And any time that I find something in nature that I think is truly amazing, um, I like to research it and find out as much about it as I can. So hopefully you'll get a little bit of information today that you didn't know about owls, and maybe it will encourage you to um, find something in nature that you enjoy, that you appreciate, and research it and find out more about it. So to start us off, um, my name is Susan Parker. I'm with the District 2 with our DEP, um, YEP Youth Environmental Program. And so we're gonna start out with a poll. Um, it should pop up here now, and it just has a few questions. If we'll just take a couple minutes and answer these questions. Um, I, there's a lot of misconceptions about owls, things that people may or may not know. So hopefully um, you can answer that poll now and we'll get to see um, what you do in, or you don't know. Okay, looks like we got some stuff coming in. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll and let's see how we did. So owls are multiple choice, and hopefully maybe you've learned a new word. We have a diurnal, which is active mainly in the day. Propescular, which is active mainly at twilight, meaning dusk or dawn. And then nocturnal, 100%, way to go, good job. Owls are indeed nocturnal animals, meaning they are active mainly at night. Owls can turn their heads all the way around. Ooh, 50-50. Well, we'll answer that question here in a minute. And do great horned owls have horns? Good job, 100%. They do not actually have horns. They have these tusks of uh, feathers. We'll talk about them too. And do owls have special feathers that help them fly silently? True with 67% um, and false 33%. Here are the results if you wanna look at them. Um, so again, 67% um, is leading there. They do actually have feathers that help them fly silently and we'll learn more about them too. So good job everybody on those polls and we'll go ahead and get started. So um, owls, there are about 200 different owl species in the world. 19 are in North America where we are. The biggest owl is called the great gray owl and it can be upwards of two feet. Our smallest owl, which is appropriately named the elf owl, is only about as big as five inches, which is teeny tiny. Um, baby owls are called owlets. Um, a group of owls is called a parliament. I didn't know that. I thought that was pretty interesting. So owls are basically these amazing birds that are we considered night ninjas. And they are nocturnal, they're active at night, and they're predators. Um, just like many of our other bird predators, eagles, hawks, uh, falcons, they are, they are amazing hunters, and meaning they prey, predators meaning they prey on other food sources. But what makes them really interesting is that they are active at night. So just like our other birds of prey, they have adaptations that make them able to be powerful hunters. And one of that is really powerful talons or claws. And you can see there in that lower right picture, they have some really um, sharp, large talons that they're able to grab up their prey. Um, owls can turn their heads, but not all the way around, only as much as 270 degrees, so almost. Um, they have special muscles and bones there in their neck that help them to, um, to turn. And someone said I still have my poll results up. Let's get those off of there. Sorry about that. Okay, so hopefully you can see the screen now. So owls also have amazing vision. So they have kind of tubular eyes, very different than ours. So it's almost like looking out of uh, binoculars. Um, this allows them to, they have these huge eyes so they can see pretty far, but they're not able to move their eyes, they're so large, so that's why they're able to move their head instead. And they have this really interesting third eyelid called a nictating membrane that I'll show you um, in, a, in a short clip here in a minute that makes them really, really interesting. 
So owls are able to very quietly fly compared to other birds of prey, and it has to do with some adaptations of their wings. And the color of owl's feathers help them blend into the environment, which if you guys know that term, maybe camouflage, absolutely. Owls um, are very beautifully designed that they camouflage right into their um, surroundings. Owls actually will hunt other owls. Some of our bigger owls um, will prey on some of the smaller ones, but they're most known as the flying mousetrap. They eat the majority of rodents in our yard, um, particularly mice, but um, moles, shrews, um, smaller birds. They'll eat snakes, reptiles, insects. Um, they also can, they'll eat possums and even skunks because they have really bad um, smell so they're able to eat some things that we would find less desirable. Um, they also eat their prey whole, which is really amazing. They will eat everything, bones, fur, and feather and all, and then they actually regurgitate up what we call an owl pellet, and you'll get to see that too here in a few minutes. So that just gives you a little bit of basic information. So there they are sneaking through the night. They have these wonderful adaptations with their wings and their feathers that make it easy for them to sneak up on their prey. So this is something I mentioned about a third eyelid, this nictating membrane. Um, owls are one of the few animals that have them. Some others that have them are polar bears and they use that to reduce reflection because you know they obviously live where there's um, a lot of snow and ice. Also alligators and crocodiles have them underwater so that they can see underwater. But owls have them because they are ambush predators. So they never know when they clamp one to their prey if it's gonna fight back. So it's basically to protect their eyelids. And you can kind of see there already, see this clear white, that is that membrane. And you can really see it um, in this video. And there he goes, he'll flap, see? That's a nictating membrane that helps to protect its eye. And I did not know that before I did this presentation. So I thought that was something really interesting to share. This is something else that makes owls really um, phenomenal predators. For example, our ears are symmetric. So they're both exactly on the same side of each, on the same side of our head. Well, when it comes to an owl, they're asymmetric. So they're just a little bit um, off of each other. And this means that the owl is able to hear noise a few seconds earlier in one ear than the other in their, in their head. So this allows them to pinpoint where their prey is to more accurately swoop down and get it. So that's another adap adaptation that they have. So here are eight amazing owls that live in West Virginia. Move myself. Um, so the first one we have is the Eastern Screech Owl. We also have the Great Horned Owl, which we know that those aren't horns at all, that they're actually just um, tusks of feathers. Then we have the Snowy Owl here in the middle. Um, the barred owl, which is this beautiful owl down here. Then we have the long-eared owl and the short-eared owl, appropriately named, even though those aren't their ears either. Um, those are just, again, tusk of feathers. Um, the saw wet owl, which is a smaller owl. And then we have the barn owl here up in the corner. So owls are basically in two main families. One is your typical or true owls. Then the other is the barn owl family, um, which are most abundant in the world. So I picked four of these owls to talk about um, and just give you a little bit of information. So this is the Eastern Screech Owl. Um, it's a smaller bird, only seven to 10 inches. The owl does not screech at all. Um, it sometimes catches insects in midair. It's primarily solitaire, meaning that it likes to be alone. And that's true for most owls. Um, but this owl will pair occasionally and roost um, during the winters in hollow trees, nests, boxes and trees with dense foliage. So that's something else about owls. Um, unlike some other predatory predator birds like eagles, they don't actually build their nest. Um, they like to either live in abandoned nests or hollow trees or nest boxes or even just trees again with dense foliage. They don't build nests. Um, their diet is varied, but the eastern screech owl eats an amazing amount, array of different things, um, insects, crayfish, earthworms even, other small um, songbirds, reptiles, um, and small mammals. Basically, a majority of owls' um, diet is going to be these uh, shrews and voles and uh, moles, uh, those things. So we're going to listen to what an eastern screech owl sounds like, and you can let me know if you think it sounds like it's screeching. And it takes a couple minutes 
um, before you actually hear him. And it's, um, you'll see that his, he puffs up right before he makes this sound. It's a very steady call. Here it goes. Hopefully you can hear that. It's just like a, a really light murmur, like we do. I just think it's really cool how he puffs up before he does the call. Yeah, so pretty neat call there with the Eastern Screech Owl. Not a screech at all. Um, and it's just a, a beautiful bird. I mean, a lot of times people think that owls hoot, that everybody has a hoot, but a lot of these owls um, have very melody-like calls. So this is the next one I wanna talk about, the great horned owl. And we did already talk about that it doesn't have horns at all. They're just tufts of feathers. Um, but the great horned owl lives in every state but Hawaii. It is one of the largest and most powerful owls in North America. Um, it's about 18 to 25 inches. It's a very powerful hunter and eats about two to four ounces of meat a day. Um, it's, uh, it has a huge appetite with that being said. Um, it can raise its ear disc feathers to amplify sounds. So just like we um, can take our hand and put it around our ears to amplify, you know, if we want to hear something, they do the same thing. And their ear discs are right here on the sides of their faces. So this is actually where their ears are on, around these uh, semicircular parts. So what they do is they um, can fluff those out to amplify what they're hearing. They have an average lifespan in the wild about five to 15 years. And that seems about general for most of these owls, even though um, there are lots of things that can um, affect their population, but they can live up to 50 years in, in captivity, captivity, which is pretty crazy. So let's hear the great horned owl. It's more of a hooting owl. See if you've ever heard it before out in the wild. <coughs> Did you guys hear that? Pretty impressive. I'll do it again. So it's more of a hooting, and you probably have heard that when you've been out. Yeah, really pretty sound with that one. So that's the great horned owl. I think it's a really pretty owl. Um, again, one of our larger owls. This is the barred owl, another interesting one. Um, it's about a medium sized owl, 17 inches to 24. It gets its name from its pattern. You can see it kind of has uh, these black streaks over white and gives it a barred um, look. It's very vocal. A lot of people recognize its call and it sounds, this is gonna be a really bad interpretation of who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. So you'll have to listen and see if you think it actually sounds like that. You'll often hear a chorus of two of them calling to each other and I have had the privilege of hearing two of them call. Uh, one was on the edge of my yard and another was across the field in front of my yard and they were calling back and forth to each other late one night. Um, it was beautiful to hear them call back and forth and they say you can tell the female by a higher pitch if you ever hear them calling to each other. So again, it prefers to nest in natural tree hollows. Um, also, it will take over abandoned stick nests of other species. Uh, what's neat about it is if it encounters a predator that it thinks is um, comparable in size to it, it will puff its feathers out to kind of dominate that other um, predator. Or if it thinks that it doesn't stand a chance, it will slim down its body as so that it looks smaller and maybe even like a stick that blends in um, with the tree or, or environment it's on. So its average lifespan in the wild is 18 years. And it is a prey of the great horned owl, the one that we just talked about. The, the great horned owl will eat and prey on other, other owls. So we're gonna listen to its call. So it's supposed to sound like, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Mm -hmm. 
that's some other noises it can make. So you think it sounds like, I want to know who comes up with like, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, like thinks that these uh, bird calls sound like, um, like words. Um, What's really neat I found is um, Cornell has these uh, bird labs and they have uh, multiple video cameras set up for different birds for different nests. I know some of you guys are familiar um, with the Eagle Nest in Shepherdstown that they have a live video camera on, but they also have a live video camera through Cornell on um, a barred owl. And this is a previously recorded one, but you can see some of the baby owls and you can tell from the feathers, they've been eating a lot of blue jays, and um, the mama birds will actually get down in there and you can see her. But you can go to these uh, live um, webcams anytime. Sometimes they're exciting and you'll get to see the birds feed or, or do something. Other times they're just kind of hanging out, but they're pretty interesting to check out and see what's going on. And she actually does get out, get down in the box and you can see her. She'll turn around and you can see her head. Yeah, there she is. So those are really neat to check out. And they have them for lots of other birds too. All right, so this is my final West Virginia bird that I wanted to talk about. This is the smallest um, owl for West Virginia, the Northern Saw Wet Owl. Um, it only gets as big as seven inches, so it's very small. And it gets its name from the sound it makes. So early settlers, um, they would sharpen their saw or, sh or sharpen a knife on what was called a whetstone. Um, so they believed that the way that its call sounded very similar to that. So I'm not sure how many of you are um, aware of a whetstone because that is kind of a historical item. I know some people do still have uh, what mimics a whetstone that they use to sharpen their knife. So I think it sounds more like a bad car alarm or maybe a bad, um, a really annoying uh, wake up alarm on your phone. So you have to see what you think. There's a relatively small population of this bir bird, but a lot of it, um, they do occupy year round this area of West Virginia. They're known to, um, to be there. They are migra migratory though. So they will, um, some of them will stay, but some of them will um, migrate southward. And that usually happens in October peak being around Halloween, the end of October, and, but they will migrate even into early December. So their preferred um, nesting grounds or breeding grounds uh, have to do with heavy, with high elevation red spruce forests, which we have abundant in that area of West Virginia. And there's actually been a lot of um, restoration going on to increase the amount of um, red spruce forests in, the, in those areas. There's been a lot of effort with that. And part of that effort is to help the population uh, of this owl because that is its preferred um, breeding grounds. So I did do some research, DNR um, in the early 2000s uh, have done a lot of research on this owl. They put up over 200 uh, nesting boxes and then documented if they saw this owl um, nesting in them. They also did um, banding stations which where they put up these huge nets and the owl actually flies into it and then they're able to safely uh, collect it and record information about its weight, um, whether it's female or male, um, how old it is, and they band them and re-release them so that they can get a better idea of what the population is like in our, in our area because very little is known about their migratory um, patterns. So that's something, um, I had a friend that participated in those banding stations. They do them sometimes at state parks. Dolly Sods does them. You have to get up really early in the morning to go about 4 a.m. before the sun is coming up, um, but it's well worth the experience if you ever get an opportunity to do that. So let's listen to its call. That's it, that's annoying beeping that you would think is a car alarm is actually this owl. I'm going to play it again. Yeah, so not owl, all owls who... Looks like I have a couple questions. I'm going to take a minute here and see. Maybe I can figure it out. <laughs> Um, we had two things on the chat, and someone says, um, it reminds me of a cicada or a grasshopper. 
And then Savannah also said, it sounds like a recorder note. I agree, it does sound like a recorder note. Good observation, Savannah. Thank you for, for um, mentioning that. So a lot of people will ask, wait, let me go back to the slide. So what affects um, these amazing owls populations? So most of our owls have pretty healthy populations, um, but some things that affect them are one, automobiles. Um, because they prey at night, they are nocturnal, so they're flying and they might not always see a vehicle and you obviously might not see them because a lot of times they're swooping down. I know during the day, sometimes you'll see hawks on the edge of fields or even up on the top of power, power poles where they're hunting that field for rodents. So owls do a lot of the same thing at night. Sometimes they'll use those same places, but they're usually near roadways. Um, so it kind of sets them up, unfortunately, to maybe get um, in an automobile accident. Um, pesticides. So because they eat so many rodents, think about how, how do you deal with mice around your home or in, in your home, in your garage, maybe in your barn or an outbuilding. Most of the time you're pitting, you might be pitting out um, a mice poison. And what happens is that mouse um, eats that and in turn dies, but then it might be a, in a place where an owl sees it and captures it to eat it. And then they're also ingesting um, those rodicides that you're using. Litter, you can see from this picture, this poor owl got tangled up in some kind of string or fishing line. So it's important when you go fishing, make sure you're bringing all that stuff back out with you. Don't leave it behind for an animal um, to be distressed by, and that's for any bird or any um, aquatic life. Balloons, I know a lot of people think that balloons are wonderful to let go and release in memory of someone, but those balloons end up in our environment. They might end up in a field where there's livestock, they might end up in a tree where this bird nests and it could get wrapped up in it. Um, or ingest it thinking that it's food, and in turn, it's, it's detrimental to the animal. Um, reduced habitat, you know, we talked about these birds really like hollow cavities and trees. So a lot of time, those are trees that aren't always the healthy, healthiest, so people are more likely to cut them down, thinking that they might fall on their own. But if it's a sturdy tree with a hollow cavity, and it's not in a position where it's going to hurt your property or your, your home or even anybody humanly harm, it'd be great to leave it because it's an additional um, habitat for, for animals, um, especially owls. Other ways you can help is volunteer or donate. Um, what comes to mind is the West Virginia Raptor Rehabilitation Center that's in Fairmont. Um, they're always looking for volunteers. You can also donate um, towards their needs to care for these animals, uh, injured owls especially. And then there's these owl nesting boxes. So I have a picture there, and this one actually you can buy um, handmade online, but there's lots of tutorials on how to make your own. So this might be something um, that interests you to do on your own property. This might be a great group activity to do some owl nesting boxes and put them on a wildlife management area or in a state park, of course, with permission and coordination. But I just think that that would be a tremendous help to these owls population. Because we, you know, even though they are healthy right now, there's always fluctuations and we need to um, consider that to make sure that they continue to stay healthy. Okay, so I get this question, um, I'm sure, you know, what do you do with an injured bird or an injured owl? So the first thing being the ages that you are would be to get an adult. And I would even say that for myself. I would never try to um, help a bird or an injured animal by myself. Um, you gotta remember, these are predators. They have those huge talons and claws. Um, they have very sharp beaks. They could cause a lot of injury to you. So the first thing you wanna do if you are considering helping a bird um, and my first suggestion would be to contact your these rehabilitation center, your local DNR or a veterinarian, just to make sure that you have a place to take this animal once you're able to safely, um, safely collect it. So first off, you wanna make a note of the location of the bird because once that bird is rehabilitated, um, it will hopefully be able to be released back into the wild and they wanna release it in its natural habitat, its natural territory. Um, if possible, approach the bird from the rear. Remember, they're mean, aggressive predators. So if they see you coming from the front, most likely they're gonna struggle and they're gonna try to fight their way out. So by approaching from the rear, you can carefully place a blanket or a jacket or any lightweight covering, and then you're gonna wanna try to grab their legs because that's where those talons are. 
Um, again, I would um, refer to an adult for help and bring in a professional. Um, the last thing you can do if you are able to um, capture a safely a, a bird, an, an injured owl, you want to put it in a cardboard box. And that box, you don't want it too big that the animal can thrash around, and you don't want it too small that it's suffocating. You just want it to be a little bit bigger than their size. And then time is of the essence being able to get it to um, a rehabilitation center or someone that is knowledgeable, um, a veterinarian, or West Virginia DNR. But please remember that all birds of prey are protected by our state and federal law, and it is illegal to harm, harass, or possess any bird of prey. So do what you can, um, do it safely, and again, promote that to other people, that it is illegal to harm, uh, harm them or possess a bird of prey. Okay, so we had talked about one other thing um, in the beginning of the presentation was how owls eat everything whole. They swallow it all up and they regurgitate it into an owl pellet. Um, so these owl pellets can range in size depending on how big the owl is. Obviously a bigger owl is going to eat more, therefore producing a bigger owl pellet. Um, they regurgitate these about once a day. They include mostly bones and fur. Um, I purchased this one online. You can purchase them online as well. A lot of rehabilitation centers offer them up um, which is great because then that money goes back to the cause. And I have here a bone sorting chart, which I talk about, and I'm gonna go ahead and play this video of me um, pulling apart. So I'm gonna show pellet. you how to do um, an owl pellet. That's something that we talked about in the presentation. So I have purchased an owl pellet online. I purchased several actually. So they are heat steamed, um, sanitized, so that you can safely um, dissect them. So this is actually a barn owl pellet, um, owl pellet, and as you can see, it's very darkly colored. It at first looks a little bit hairy too. So over time, um, you know, a lot of this is is hair, and uh, the coloring really comes from what they've been eating. So the easiest way to dissect them is really just to break them apart. And you can use tweezers or toothpicks or whatever, but I'm just going to use my hands. Um, so I have a bone chart with me, um, and this talks about uh, rodents, shrews, which are very similar to moles, moles, and birds. And then it has a display of what the different bone parts would look like, particularly the, the skulls. Um, we have the jaw, shoulder blades, front legs, your hips, um, hind legs. And as you can see, the, the bones look a lot like um, bones that we have, just on a very much smaller scale. So we'll see what we can find. I've done a couple pellets before and I was able to get some skulls out of them, which I have them here. Hopefully you can see that. So we'll work on this one and see what all we can find. Um, you typically find a lot of smaller bones and I purchased this owl pellet online, but a lot of our raptor um, rehabilitation places, you can purchase um, them from, from them um, which is helpful because that's money that goes back into their care and um, taking care of um, these uh, these rehabilitated birds. So here, if I'm looking at my diagram, um, this bone looks like a part of a, I am going to say either the hind leg of a rodent or um, part of a shrew's hind, hind leg. Um, let's see what else we can find. It is uh, very fluffy, hairy, because you're dealing with all of this um, mice fur. And they regurgitate about once every day. So this I'm looking at um, looks to be a jaw of a rodent and it's actually broken off. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. And I have this looks like a skull coming out of this piece. And of course um, the more time you take to really do it the better intact the bones are and you can see more. So this is actually the skulls. Most of the times with the skulls, you'll find that um, 
the top top part of the skull and the bottom jar, jaw part are usually not together. But this one looks almost like it is. But I could be wrong. As you can see, um, the eye sockets there, and I'm taken out around. And um, the rest of the head there. I keep pulling off more of the fur. Yeah, and you can see kind of there's the bottom jaw, of the skull. See, it's still intact. But you don't get that um, lucky very often. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Lots of bones, you'll see right away when you start into it. Um, there's lots of teeny tiny bones. So it's really cool to take it apart and then try to figure out um, what you're looking at. So this looks like um, part of the jaw and this little tip here looks like a tooth. And if I pull, it should come out. Yeah, there's a tooth of a rodent, rodent, yeah. And we've got other jaw pieces. Uh, typically in a, in a pretty decent sized owl pellet like this one, you'll get at least two, three skulls, depending on what size they are. So I'm not gonna um, completely dissect this one just for the sake of time. I will later, um, but I just wanted to let you see what it was like when you actually take one apart. And um, I encourage you, you can um, easily get them online, get one and dissect it and um, take a look at all the different. Yeah, so they are really cool. It is really furry. If you're not into animal fur, I wouldn't suggest it. But when you break it apart and see all of these teeny tiny little pieces, even like the vertebrae and the ribs and line them out, it's, it's really interesting. And I apologize, my video wasn't exactly as clear as I'd like it to be. Um, but there are some really great videos online of dissections um, where you can see the bones a little bit better than I did. But if you're looking for a fun project, um, they're pretty inexpensive. You can go online and purchase one and then dissect it on your own. Um, so that completes my presentation today. Um, just a few resources. Cornell Lab um, has those bird cams that I talked about, um, the barred owl one. I know they have several eagle ones, even some bird feeder ones. If you just want to jump online and see what those birds are doing from day to day. Uh, National Geographic has a lot of great information about owls, some really good videos. Audubon for kids. Audubon is a wonderful um, resource for anything with birds. And Audubon for Kids actually has um, some specific uh, presentations on, on owls and some activities that you can easily do at home. Um, if, you're, if you're here today, that means you're participating in our virtual camp. Thank you very much for, for checking it out. Um, we'll have videos again tomorrow. We have another webinar tomorrow at 1.30 called Single Use Plastics. If you haven't registered for that, um, go online to our webpage um, and get registered because it's gonna be really good. And again, my name is Susan. I'm with the YEP program. If you're not a member of our youth environmental program and you're interested in it, um, feel free to reach out to myself and I'll get you in contact um, with maybe your district leader if I'm not um, over your counties. It's a great program. And that concludes my presentation today. I hope you guys learned something. Um, if anybody has any comments or questions, I think we have a couple here in the chat. Um, Ruby wants to know if baby owls are born with sharp claws. Um, they are, but they, they of course grow in time and get longer and sharper. Um, someone said, thank you. That was really cool. Thanks, Fanna, appreciate it. And JD, thanks for logging on today. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, hopefully we'll catch you tomorrow on another uh, great webinar that my coworkers are doing. All right. Thanks everyone.